You were listening to the Never Meet Your Heroes podcast, conversations with artists about their work and inspiration. I am your host, Anthony Moses Sanchez. All right. Thanks for being on our podcast today. I have today Felix Deon, and uh, he's here with us from uh, Mexico City on Skype. Thank you for being with me and meeting with me today. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Al contrario. <laughs> <laughs> It's really exciting to have you on the um, podcast because um, some of my friends that are artists uh, here in the Pomona, L.A. area and um, are already fans of your stuff. Um, and I know one of my friends, Trevor, uh, who was on one of my episodes and was kind of my mentor, has already met you in Mexico City once. So it's one of those, like, I'm going to be interviewing Felix. And uh, I know my friend Raul said he wants your life. So, <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure that, amazing. yeah. <laughs> So uh, you've you've been covered pretty pretty much on um, you know different articles throughout the years. I did a little research before I spoke with you, so I don't want to get into like the basic stuff. Um, but we definitely at least initially want to have you introduce yourself as far as uh, a little bit of what I've seen so far is that you've you consider yourself Mexican American. You grew up in Guadalajara. Um, I grew up in LA, but I'm from Guadalajara. You're from Guadalajara, and then you came to America. You lived in the Palisades. You were in San Francisco, New York, Milan, Tennessee, and Buenos Aires. So why don't you uh, quickly catch people up with some of your, you know, how you ended up in Mexico City being this fabulous queer man that everybody yearns to be. Well, it's, I, I was in San Francisco for a really long time. It was kind of like my base. I would... I was I went there for college and then I would go to other places to live for a while then I would come back to San Francisco and um, and then about five years ago it just became too expensive to live in San Francisco especially as an artist who lives on the sale of my own work mm -hmm. and um, and I'd already been traveling a lot to Mexico City uh, my family's from Guadalajara so I would I would go visit there and then I would go to Mexico City and ultimately I just decided that um, the U.S. was just too expensive okay <laughs> and also, I you know like I'm proud of my roots i love mexico um i'm you know like i was excited to, to to think to come back here so it's like so mexico has been my my home base since about five years ago okay well what what about mexico city has been great for your art so far um well a big part of it is financial it's it's much cheaper here okay and um so I, I've been able to like live here and uh, and support myself as an artist and have higher assistance and live in a great part of town and so like that part of it has been really great and it's also just a really like international city so there's like major museums there's like lots of um, lots of artists around me there's a lot of a lot to inspire me in, as an artist so okay. um, you know it's just like I just think I just love Mexico City so. Um, I, it's a very liberal city. It's like I don't feel like it's any different than San Francisco in that regard. All right. um, yeah, in fact, it, sometimes it feels even more liberal to the extent that like public displays of affection are more accepted in Mexican culture than they are in the U.S. So you see right. like gay, gay people making out on the metro and things like that. You, know, you see like more display, like public displays of gayness than you do even in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think um, – was it am – I, is my history right that like gay marriage was like in this – allowed in the city or before even America was or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but uh, I know that we don't need to get into how the rest of the country goes, but I know that that's you know, outside of Mexico City, um, sometimes people have issues with coming out or, or you know, queer yeah. expression. It's much less liberal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's less liberal. Yeah. I like the way that goes. I'm always like – I'm always confused by the situation elsewhere because – it's like the same as when I lived in San Francisco. Like, um, if I would leave my little bubble of California liberalness, I would. I was sometimes a little like nervous and like, oh no, I'm in the Midwest or something, you know, something like that. Yeah. And you know, I discovered that it wasn't as crazy as I thought it was. It's just like I had my California prejudices, and I feel the same about being in Mexico City. Like, uh, I just went to visit the town that my my family's from, Cocula, which is uh, about an hour from Guadalajara, uh -huh. and I discovered that there was like a gay couple living there openly, which surprised me. You know, so it's yeah. just, I don't know. There's just like things that. Uh, it's more accepting in general, I feel like, than um, than I had thought. Okay. Although I'm sure that there's also like problems that I don't, you know, I don't, I can't speak to it because I don't, I haven't personally experienced it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're not going to be responsible for. <laughs> you're not here to report everybody's experience in Mexico <laughs> yeah. City. Um, yeah. One of the things that turned up on my research was well that you have a twin. Um. Yes, Marcelito. Okay. Uh, so I thought that was interesting, but he isn't, he doesn't, uh, he's not part of any of your, I should back up and make sure people that are listening and aren't familiar with your work, um, uh -huh. the style of your work typically is kind of, uh, 
nostalgic etchings in a kind of um, Edwardian, Victorian, and sometimes Art Nouveau style that uh, kind of like a revision of gay history of images from that. Am I describing that right for you? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. Okay. <laughs> that's a good it probably, as you began, it was probably a much smaller scope. But as time has gone on, you've explored other other yes, um, subjects. Yes, other styles and also other subject matter. Initially, it was more just like Latino and white gay men. And then mm. as time passed, you know, like now I paint lesbians and transgender people and like a much broader variety of, of people than I used to. Like a broader spectrum of the queer community. Yeah. I mean, you have to forgive me when I fanboy because I do definitely – one of the exciting things about some of the, the artwork that you do – and how it gets, it exposes me to other sexualities. I'm very, I've worked with Tom of Finland Foundation um, and been around a lot of erotica for a couple of years. So, huh. you know, it, it's really great when something surprises you and excites you and, you know, makes you a little hot and you don't realize <laughs> like, hey, wow, like, look at that. You know, oh, that's, that's two lesbians or that's transgender people. So that's really exciting yeah. to see that and that you're explored, you know, the whole spectrum. Um, yeah. I, I know it came up, but maybe to tell quickly some of the listeners that don't aren't familiar, I feel like I'm answering a lot of things for you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, your earlier influences with, with this style was through your mom? Um, yes. Uh, as a kid, my mom used to take us to a lot of museums and things like that in the L.A. area, like the Huntington Library and things like that. So mm -hmm. I was exposed young to very, like, conservative kinds of artworks, like uh, Rococo and 19th century art that I used to love and which I still love. Mm -hmm. And also we had a lot of children's books that were really beautiful that were antique you know like victorian edwardian mid-century type books and i think that my current love for these styles definitely came from my childhood exposure to them you know mm -hmm. and also from the fact that when i would see these kinds of books they were always they were pretty much always like white people and straight people and so um as an adult it's been nice to insert you know like queer people into those narratives right I mean, one yeah. thing that's interesting for me when i look at your work though is you know I'm someone who's who studied literature, and uh -huh. there there definitely was a period with like Oscar Wilde, like people that were creating uh you know queer art or what would be seen as now as queer art, but visually it didn't exist. So in writing, as a, as as a, someone who's read some of these books, like even you know picture of Dorian Gray, who's kind of obviously coded as like a gay novel, yeah. um, if you read it and you visualize it, so. In my head, when I look at the pictures, they kind of feel very like, where have these been all these yeah. centuries? Which I think is what's yeah. exciting about it. Um, yeah. And were you seeing similar things? Is that what, you, as, you're, as you're saying, you know, you didn't, you only saw well, the white people, you only saw. Yeah. Well, it's like, I mean, they're like, even like the examples that you suggested, like Dorian Gray, who's coded gay, it's like, it's coded gay, it's not explicitly gay. You know, right. it's like, we that he was gay, you know, like that we, I mean, Oscar Wilde was gay. And we know that, you know, it's like, or like, um, uh, in search of lost time by Proust, it's like just, uh, Albertine is clearly a gay man, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, written as a woman. Right. And like, um, I think that it's really, you know, like when I read those books, it's like, I'm reading, I'm reading that queer context into it, Right. but it's really nice to live today where I can, it's not a queer context. It's explicitly queer. Or right. a color, you know, like of uh, minorities, and um, and that's something that I felt like wasn't there. That even if the artist wanted it to be there, couldn't actually put it there, and that now it's like we have all of this freedom to do so. And since we have the freedom, we should definitely take advantage of it. Right, especially because, um, well, again, someone who's kind of I've looked at a lot of gay history. There's definitely cycles of when gay expression is kind of blossoms, and then kind of there's always a conservative backlash that kind of suppresses it. So it does yeah. feel like. Um, I feel like for gay artists, until that freedom exists permanently, there definitely yeah. is a, like you definitely have to be aware of like you need to produce, 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 because you don't know when the next book burning is going to happen. And it's sad, yeah. but it's a possibility. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I love that you're you're prolific so far. And yeah. how, how long have you been working on, on this particular sets of, of work? Um, about... Seven or eight years, maybe, okay. is when I started using like the, the kind of artwork that's that looks like what I do now. Mm -hmm. Not very long. Okay, you have you have a lot of artwork that's for sale uh, online on Etsy and eBay. Um, you mentioned that you have the freedom, and that freedom is the internet that you have direct access to 
consumers and art lovers. Um, yes. Do you think that if without that technology, you would? You, how do you think you would have navigated that? It's hard to imagine, but it's really hard to imagine. It's like I think that I. Well, I mean, I would be a gallery artist. I do show in galleries every now and then, but it's like being able to just be my own. You know, like Insta- Instagram. You know, is basically like a marketing tool that lets people know that I exist. And then and like the more followers I have in, on Instagram, the more artwork I sell on Etsy, which allows me to keep on making more artwork. And, you know, so it's like uh, social media and modern technology definitely has allowed my ability to be an artist to, to, to you know, to flourish mm-hmm. in a way galleries don't. Galleries are, are limiting. They're very limiting. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think so far with the people that are my friends or people that I've talked to on the podcast already, that, you know, the studio art, you know, it's like a waiting game and it's a networking thing and yeah. you have direct access is um, something that's, I think, exciting about why why us as the public get to see so much of your work so frequently. Yeah. Is there any any advice you'd give to anybody that wants to kind of get into their queer art or even just, you know, any kind of artwork and getting it on Etsy and eBay? Any advice to anyone that's listening and kind of gets inspired by, by you? Uh, I think that it just requires a lot of discipline in terms of like of regularly producing artwork, making sure that it's like the the social media is a total key to it. It's if I didn't have as many followers as I have on Instagram and that kind of thing, I wouldn't be able to make the living that I do. So it's like posting things online every single day and like being a relentless self promoter. Right. (laughs) It's like those things definitely help because without doing that, I wouldn't be able to make a living. All I do all day long, every single day is paint. Like I have no other job. It is my job. Right. And um, it's really great. And I feel like, if I have advice, like, or if I feel like when I see people who, for whom it hasn't worked out, I feel like in part it's because they don't keep it up long enough. Because it's it takes a little bit of time to to get an audience and to um, make it work as a business, and it requires you know, and, and like some of that time it just feels like nothing is happening because you're you know it's it's slow initially, but I think that if you just keep at it and you're and you're good, that you know that it'll it'll happen. Right. Well, I guess I'll mention as well that. Um that it's fun to also see you on Snapchat. I think we get the more uncensored version on Snapchat. Yes, the very and, uncensored. <laughs> and um, that's that's mostly where I see. But then I'm a okay. thirsty hoe, so I know where to look for all this stuff. <laughs> um, sorry, mom. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there. So I think that that's really fun to kind of experience that. Um, I have a very colorful one, so it's easy to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <a> there. <laughs> there definitely is. Let's get into some of your your stronger influences that are uh, really obvious to at least me. I'm kind of similar to your story in that my grandma took me to LACMA a lot, so that was kind of our, our regular outings. So okay. LACMA is where I saw a lot of artwork, and um, so I, the stuff that, that uh, like George Barbier and um, Hokusai, which is uh, his famous work, is the the blue that wave. You know, th- those are the t- the two obvious things that you you know you synthesized. You know, it can they keep coming back as far as the etching styles. Better question might be how how are you processing the work? You have your models first, yeah, right. Um, yeah. Do you kind of have an idea beforehand what you're doing as far as the, the models? Sure. And the... Usually I have an idea for the model before the model gets here. Okay. And take maybe two or three photos of a particular painting that I want to make. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so like for those ones, it's like I might semi-dress the model or dress them all together or, you know, like have props and like everything because I know exactly what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And then I'll use like take a lot of photos of them, you know, like especially if I have couples, like just kissing and being romantic and, you know, pretending to engage, to propose to one another, all kinds of just whatever things, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, which then I have this, I have a massive database of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of photos. Um, so when I'm painting, it's like, I'll do the paintings that I planned from initially, but then I'll also make paintings where I didn't plan it, but I just have a couple that are kissing and I think it's a really great photo and they look beautiful. And, and then I'll invent something around that. So, so like once I have the photo, then I, um, I usually trace the, the figures. Mm-hmm. I could draw the but there's no reason because um, it just takes more time, you know? Right. So, uh, and then I usually invent the clothing. They're usually nude when I take the picture, and then I invent whatever they're wearing on top. Right. Along with the and then at that point is usually when I'll be paying attention to different styles. So it's like, because like one of the things that I do a lot is I have, I collect um, antique music sheets, mm-hmm. and I cut out the 
original picture and use the frame, the antique frame. So then based on the frame, I'll, it'll determine the style of the picture. So if it's like an Art Nouveau frame, then when I'm making the painting, I'll be looking at Art Nouveau pictures of like, how do they draw flowers and how do they draw clothes and what mm -hmm. kind of clothes are appropriate to an Art Nouveau painting. And, you know, so then I do a bunch of research and like, uh, and so the, the paintings kind of come together that way. Okay. Well, I, I want to yeah. bring one example up that you did recently, Tattoo Lovers, um, that uh, I know... Again, because I follow you on uh, definitely on Snapchat, and then I, sometimes I see stuff on Instagram. Uh, yeah. And I know that that image, if people are looking at it and they haven't seen the behind the scenes stuff, and they could probably find it if they scroll back through your Instagram stuff. Um, yeah. That's a good example of like that. You would think that that image is exactly verbatim, if you will, and that you yeah. kind of, you know, created something else from those models. Well, the models were actually me and a friend of mine. Right. And, um, yeah, and so then, and you know, since I mean I'm Latino, but I look white, <laughs> and, um, and my the other model is like Mexican and, and like is he's what people tend to think a Mexican looks like, you know? I don't know. Okay. And, uh, so then, since I since, since I in that particular case, I decided to be faithful to what to our like what we look like. Uh -huh. So I painted him with um, I made him look kind of cholo, you know, with like like uh, tattoos and like a headband and things like that. And then I gave mm -hmm. myself like like old fashioned like sailor type um tattoos and like uh, uh, uh you know like so but it's like the picture was just like two nude people neither of whom have tattoos the original photo right and then from that i felt like i wanted to make this sort of interracial image that was going to you know play with these tattoos and like the kind of loving pose between us yeah uh so really like taking painting taking really masculine imagery like of cholos and things like that and mm -hmm. like making them and gay and you know like and queering them so right. i don't know where that thing have come from yeah. yeah, my my two favorites. I made notes here in case I wanted to bring them up. Was the Amor Navu and Amor uh -huh. Picante. Those uh -huh. were like two. So that, those are two examples. Like especially Amor Picante, which is, um, you know, a, a big kind of oso style yeah. Mexican yeah. on top of a big chile, and like he was actually a friend that guy. Was he? And, uh, yeah, and actually Amor Nouveau uh -huh. was the same guy, but with me. It's like I painted it uh, as a present for him. Okay. Like, it's the same model. <laughs> Excellent. That's always yeah. fun. Um, but yeah, it's great to see these things. And I remember I showed my friend the Amor Picante, and um, she was like, that's so gay and so Mexican, which I'm sure is what you were going for. I mean, yes. it, it, it hit all the buttons. So yes. um, one thing that I thought it was interesting that when I was digging up your 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 past was, uh, you know, because we're talking about the nude models, and you, sometimes you model nude as well. Uh, yes. for some of these images um yes. is part of your do you identify as like a nudist or is that just is it just free love or how would you describe I, that part of your life so i wouldn't identify as a nudist but clearly i am <laughs> <laughs> like, um i just uh i'm i think i'm more of a sensualist okay. i don't know like like I, I like um i have these parties where i strip everybody naked and dress them in jewels and i, li I have i live with a couple of handsome boys and my boyfriend and like basically we only wear clothes occasionally and right. <laughs> it's nice and warm in Mexico. And so it's just, I don't know. Like I love the body. I love like, uh, I'm super sex positive. I'm, you know, and it just seems like it's a more enjoyable way to live life to be, to embrace the body and to embrace nudity and sensuality and, and you know, that kind of beauty than to not. And why would you, if you, why wouldn't you, if you can? Right. I mean, I'm definitely, I've, I have been invited to plenty of parties in the same vein, it, it, you know, uh -huh. but I think when it's consenting and yes. uh, all adults agree in our understanding of the situation, it can be a beautiful and fun experience. And it yes. isn't always sexual, which I think is, um, I actually uh, was at a nudist beach. Well, I've gone to the nudist beach here in San Diego, Black Beach, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, uh -huh. And I've been to the one in Maui called Little Beach. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you always either have the onlookers who are just think it's silly or you have the people that are just kind of like, ah, like, finally, I can just be myself. So, yes, it's true. Um, yes. So outside looking in, that's what's fun about watching your little soirees that you have. have um, <laughs> um, well, they're fun. to. Sh I mean, it's like fun to be in and it's fun to share as well. So, right. you know. <laughs> I mean, I think that, I think it fits with the style of your artwork, though. I think that like that's one fun thing about your artwork is you kind of walk the walk, talk the talk. Um, yes. You, you know, the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties was definitely that time of period. And um, yes. 
And even to connect again with the, your, the idea that your revisionist artwork, um, that there were ta- – that was a time in the 20s before the pansy scare um, yeah. where, you know, where um, – I'm forgetting her name. Mae West. So, Mae you West. know, uh, Mae, Mae West was w- one of the people who kind of caused the pansy scare. Not necessarily caused it, but she, she had a lot of gay men around her for obvious yeah. reasons. And yeah. um, so, you know, there was there was a time people that don't know, you know, when we when we're saying that you're reclaiming history, in some ways you're you're kind of bridging the gap between what yeah. actually was already happening, and your parties yeah. kind of reflect that. Yeah. Although the thing that's beautiful about today is like, in the past, it's like like in the twenties, for example, like Berlin, you know, like mm. there were places that were mostly open and tolerant and things like that. But even then, it was still within a very small, the, the bubble of acceptance was very small. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, since basically ancient Rome, <laughs> right. it's like acceptance has been small. And it's like kind of incredible to live in a time where there's been a sea change, where it's like, it's not just like that there's little bubbles, like say Mexico City or San Francisco where it's accepted, but like mm-hmm. now more than, I don't know what the, the exact percentage is, but it's like over 50% of Americans support gay marriage, for example. Right. It's just incredible. You know, so it's like the fact that there is gay marriage and like, all, you know, and the, that was a, not even a dream in the 20s. Like, people couldn't even imagine that. Like, it wasn't even, like, a thought for the future. Whereas now it's a reality in, like, an increasingly large part of the world. And it's it's pretty incredible to live in this moment when that's that's the, the case, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All, all we have is, you know, the written records and sometimes some little, like, you know, picture, like little films that might have been made. Um, but definitely it was a time where... You had these little parties where you can where you can be yourself, but then probably when you went home, you had to go back and put your to- suit and tie and hat on, and you know. And even in some of these places, they, those parties were illegal. It's like not right. like you know, like New York, for example. It's like you know, there was certainly tolerant areas there as well, but like ultimately, um, like I made a painting called the Gladys, uh, the Wedding of Gladys Bentley, who was a jazz singer from a blues singer actually from the. Mm. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance and she, she married a woman and she, you know, she had like a public wedding mm-hmm. where she, where, you know, where she married this woman in the twenties. And, um, and you know, so there was a moment where that was somewhat acceptable, but even then it's like, there were still raids at gay bars. Right. And ultimately when she died, she had converted to Christianity and she had renounced her whole gay way of life. And, you know, cause she'd like, you know, after the twenties, like even those little windows are closed, but, mm-hmm. but, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's like, it, we live in an extraordinary time, which is mm-hmm. it's kind of to me that, you know, right. That that's know. The case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you think about, uh, you know, as at least here in America, we're dealing with this neo-Nazi thing coming up again. And you think, yes. again, we were talking about the 1920s and, and Berlin and the cabarets and the queer culture that existed there. And it's brought up, been brought up on the TV series Transparent as well. You know, mm-hmm. just so visually people, you know, that aren't familiar with it. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, it's like right now with the internet, we're we we're so connected, and it's just wonderful. I mean, even right now, I'm talking to you. You're in Mexico City, um, yeah. So, yeah. And one one other influence that well, so there was a couple of artists that have come up when people ask you, you know, who are you, you know, currently or more contemporary influenced by, and one is Kara Walker, who she comes up a lot for a lot of people. Um, yes. I love- uh, what 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 about her specifically? Do you feel like you relate to her? Well, like when when I was in college, I kind of discovered her and that I loved her. It's like um, I guess as a, like a gay Mexican American in college, like you know she's she's a African American artist and speaks to the black experience. But I mm-hmm. felt like um, and she's also speaking about a specific experience within that, which is usually has to do with slavery. Right. Um, nonetheless, in a larger way, I felt like she she has a, a a really great technique in terms of like a classical technique and uh and she uses it to critique the culture that we're living in in a way that's really profound um in a very modern and uh, contemporary way and uh so from very early on i was i was really in love with her because i felt like she was a way for me to imagine how i could use my own technique um to say something um that's relevant to like contemporary culture uh you know i mean that's that's just in my own personal right. how can i this thing that I'm looking at way, you know, like I right. also just think she's an incredible artist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then another one that com- that comes up frequently for that you bring up is Felix Gonzalez Torres, who is a Cuban yeah. and lived through that. He's one of those artists who lived through that AIDS era and like art was just had to be kind of like 
There's just some yes. artists that just like that. Larry Kramer also wrote about that period, and it it was a very specific energy. Um, yeah. It, what what about his stuff um, relates to yours? Because Felix's stuff is a little bit more art gallery style. Well, yeah, I mean, like my work is much more conservative. Right. <laughs> than his. It's, it's like more traditional, you know. Uh-huh. Like it's, it's uh, you know, I do like. I paint and draw and he does like installation and performance art and right. things like that. They, I don't know how much influence he's actually had on my work. I okay. feel like he's, he, it's, I just love him as an artist. Okay. Uh, I think that he's somebody that, um, whenever I come across his work in a gallery, I feel really you know moved by it. I think he's mm-hmm. really incredible or he was really incredible. But, um, but yeah, as far as like it, the influence on my own day to day life and work, it's like, it's not something that I think about so much. Mm-hmm. It's just that I love which is why I brought him up in a couple of different um, interviews. Okay. Well, that's good, good yeah. to clarify that. Um, yeah. One thing I wanted to, to maybe back up a bit on is there's a little bit of a story that like in your youth, when you came to Mexico City, like about 16, that that's kind of, you know, you did did um, figure drawing stuff or modeling. So, yes. Um, would you be willing to expound on what that experience was like? The um, Well, it used to, that used to be my job. Like okay. I used to be a, a, an artist model. Okay. So like uh, that's uh, I, I that was actually like also the last thing I did before my work started selling and I could just become be an artist, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, it it depended on in San Francisco I could work at um, there were like three or four different art schools mm-hmm. and a lot of artists. So it was possible to just do that as a full time job. And then because I've lived a kind of a bohemian life of travel all over the place, mm-hmm. it was also that I could do when I would arrive at different places and like go online or go to the local art school and just like figure out like it was an easy way to get like under the table work. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> that could, like help fund my roving lifestyle of irresponsible like uh, you know traveling pleasure. Right. <laughs> so, and it was also fun. It was like like of all the jobs I've I've had a lot of jobs. Yeah. And uh, it was one of the ones that I enjoyed the most. Like because. Uh, uh, I felt like I was good at I haven't done it in years now, uh-huh. but like I, I was good at it. Like it was fun to watch the, the look at the artwork that the students were making. Um, it got it got me in all kinds of like strange situations in terms of like artists and, you know, I don't know, some of which were, <laughs> were just unusual. Of course. <laughs> so like, right. you know, I don't know. It was it was a fun, a fun way to make money. Um, yeah. But did you feel like, I guess there's an assumption maybe if someone looks at that, like myself included, that like that's how you got into the, you know, this, you, the sensual artwork that you do? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that that's just me. Okay. <laughs> like, actually, it's like me winding up an artist model is more an expression of like uh-huh. that kind of sensuality and exhibitionism that I have anyway, you know? Right. So it's like... Uh, um, I started doing figure drawing workshops and things like that is in high school. So it's oh. like it's exposed from really young to mm-hmm. that as a possibility. And also I knew I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. And, um, so I would paint other students in my high school and I would paint, um, uh, like I was doing like, like I was already doing this from really young, like mm-hmm. and it's hard inspired by the books I was reading. Cause I would go to the, the library and check out books about Michelangelo and, Degas and like you know all of these like mm. art stars of history and like basically that's what everybody did so I was like well I need to do this too and um, mm-hmm. then because I was already doing that then I got you know packed off to junior college so that I could take uh, figure drawing classes that well not just figure drawing classes art classes but mm-hmm. being drawing classes and um, you know and so like since I was already in that environment and seeing what was going on and what these possibilities were then it just made sense that when I would like you know, run away from home, <laughs> leave my like wild life that I would like, you know, do that as a way to make money. Cause it was already in my head as a possibility. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Michelangelo ha- has probably influenced a lot of people, especially with the, the nude figures that he's yeah. done. Um, yeah. They're so gay. <laughs> they're so gay. They're so beautiful. It yeah. doesn't even, I feel like if you, it, it's hard when you're a gay man, you, you obviously enjoy the male figure. So, yeah. but I feel like anyone that goes, you know, is uncertain, they could see, you know, a Michelangelo painting or, or David is a yeah. very obvious, uh, you know, yeah. statue where you're like, wow, like, isn't, aren't humans beautiful? Um, yes. N- not to be too uh, cisgendered, <laughs> uh, you know, they're all beautiful, but um, yes. he definitely has some very beautiful work there. So why don't we catch up on some 
you know, how, how are things been there in Mexico City since the earthquake? Uh, how long has it been now? Like two months now since the earthquake? Something like that, yeah. It basically feels like it didn't happen already. <laughs> okay. Well, with all the, at least <laughs> like, here in America with all the news, uh, it's hard. It was, I definitely felt like it happened when it happened. I was like of freaking course. the hell out. Like I thought my, you know, it was like, it was terrifying. It was like, I like, you know, like I and everybody I knew thought they were going to die. Oh, but, okay. Uh, yeah, it was, ter- it was super terrifying. Um, uh, like I completely freaked out. There were cracks in the walls of my house because oh, my no. whole building tilted backwards and was crashing against the building behind us. Wow. Uh, there were like little skinny cracks and an engineer okay. came. Not, not, they were long, but narrow. Okay. And an engineer came and said that my house is fine and there's nothing to worry about. Um, but when the cracks appeared, uh, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> I All was right. thinking, oh, my house is going to fall down any second. Um, and I don't know, like it, it was really intense. Um, but, uh, like if you walk in for five blocks in almost any direction, something uh-huh. fell down. Um, okay. and, uh, but you can also like walk for, you know, like you have to kind of like, if you choose your path carefully, you can like, you know, not even realize that anything had ever happened. You know, okay. it's like, uh, cause it's like, uh, it's a huge city and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot of buildings did fall down and a lot were condemned and, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I have friends, uh, I have at least one friend who lost his, his, his building collapsed. Wow. Um, but, uh. Um, but now it's been, you know, a couple of months out and, uh, we'll have, you know, found new places to live and, you know, um, I don't know. It, it's like cleaned up and moved on and like, and prices have gone up. <laughs> oh, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> I thought for sure they were going to go down, but they didn't. They went up. So, yeah, I mean, um, I guess it's something to talk about for people that live in the, you know, here in the Pacific, uh, in that ring of fire area where the te- tectonics, uh, change so much, yeah. you know, like I've lived through the Whittier Narrows earthquake and the Northridge earthquake. And there hasn't really been a big earthquake here in L.A. yet. And um, I know people that haven't sat, been through an earthquake. It's horrifying the first time. Yeah. Um, do you, how many have you? There was several re- recently in, in Mexico, though. There was the one that we yeah. just spoke of. Well, there have been a bunch in Mexico that have been big enough to scare people. And, like, you know, everybody runs out. But this is the first one. Like, I was in the Northridge quake, you know, mm-hmm. uh, when I was little. But I was really young. I, mm-hmm. I don't remember it well, other than that it was scary. But uh-huh. like this is my first, the first time I've been in a city when a national, natural, a nat- natural disaster happened. Okay. And it was pretty amazing. It's like everybody was, you know, like there were so many people at the volunteer station, you know, like the um, centers de acopio, like the, the, I don't know what the, you say that in English, like the centers for helping people. Uh-huh. That uh, they they would open these stations where you would go and get helped. Okay. And uh, so many people would go there to get um, to volunteer that there was like you know you had to wait for like two hours just to like help. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you know, like, people were like, you know, rescuing stray dogs that had been lost and like bringing people into their homes and yeah. eating stuff. And like there were piles and piles and piles of stuff that people had donated. And, right. you know, it was pretty beautiful to see how everybody came together and helped each other out. And, you know, um, uh, it was it was quite inspiring. And it was, you know, also really terrifying because, you know, they were digging people out for quite a while afterwards. And, right. um, and you know, just in my normal day-to-day life of wandering around, it would be like, oh, my God, that building's gone, too. And, you know, like that kind of experience. Yeah. My neighborhood was kind of the worst hit. The mm-hmm. neighborhood next to mine was much worse. Like, when I went to Condesa mm-hmm. and walk, went for a walk over there and not really realizing it, and, like, there was a, there was a street where basically every third house had fallen down. Um, so, I don't know. It was, it was intense. Um, yeah. But, I don't know. Life moves on, so... Yeah, it sounds like things are pretty organized there. I, I've seen documentaries about Japan that has a similar system where, because they get a lot of earthquakes and yeah. like the whole neighborhoods, there's systems to like take care of uh, elderly people and get them prescriptions. And I don't know that. if it's like I've heard stories afterwards about the way people were being dug out of the buildings that was not the right way, and uh-huh. you know, like some of the people who volunteered were saying how they were getting like the same things would be moved from center to center without like. It just, I don't know, like, the gov- I'm, I'm skeptical of the government here. I think the people hmm. came out, were really doing their 110%. Um, but, you know, they're not professionals. And so, like, not everything was done the way it should have been done. <laughs> Maybe to move a little bit towards the p- to politics, I, I do want to go back to, I've read that you identify as Chicano. And, you know, even here in L.A., you know, my family's been, you know, in the United States since at least the great, before the Great Depression. Um, yeah. So we definitely, as uh, as a family, you know, uh, we don't we don't know Spanish, um, but we still have a very kindred spirit with Mexicans uh, because yeah. our culture. We, we keep getting immigrants here, and that's you know, in the '70s when the Chicano movement happened, 
um, there was definitely this sense of like, you know, if I went to Mexico now, I would be identified as an American. And yeah. so I'm curious with you, you ha- you've lived between the two borders. Um, how, how do you define what it means to be Mexican-American or Chicano? Uh, I, well, that's so difficult. And <laughs> also and partly because I'm very white looking. I'm mm-hmm. like really, you know, I have blue eyes and blonde hair. It's like, so in the U.S., like I definitely didn't feel like a normal white person mm-hmm. <laughs> because um, I was raised in a Mexican household. I learned English as a second language. Mm-hmm. Like my culture was very much not like a mainstream white culture. Right. So I felt like the white students in the school around me were not like me. They were different than me. I was like the Mexican students or the Chicano mm-hmm. students. Right. Uh, also like white people have had a tendency to say crazy things about Mexicans in front of me my whole life <laughs> because they just assume I'm white. Did we so, live like, the same life? <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. But then like, but then Latinos in the U S had a tendency to treat me weird too, because right. I'm so white. So it's like when I used to self identify as Chicano in the U S like sometimes people would take a, would like be weird to me about that. Like, uh-huh. uh, like oh, I'm happy Chicano because you have blue eyes or something, you know, it's like, uh-huh. I remember as a kid going to a Mecha meeting um, mm-hmm. to get a scholarship to go to college. And uh, so I was like sitting there like there was like a, it was like a political rally. And uh, he was talking about La Raza de Bronce and like this whole like, you know, brown power kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and well, I'm not brown at all. And so like I remember feeling the longer I sat there listening to it, I wanted to sink into my seat and disappear because it was like people were looking at me like, what is this white boy doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> because it was, talk- it was a lot about like white uh, uh, brown power and like right. the white people land and like this whole kind of thing which i totally get all of that it's just like my presence there is just strange and so i'm treated in this rather strange way and ultimately i actually did get that scholarship and i went to, to you know to university and a uh, latino uh, scholarship uh-huh. uh, but like my feelings about what i am were always very confused in the u.s ultimately i came to the decision that i'm chicano with white privilege okay <laughs> um but then I moved to Mexico, and it kind of clarified everything because in Mexico I realized I'm just I'm just American. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I have. A, I mean, my relationship to Mexico is also funny because within Mexico, sometimes people when I make really Mexican artwork, people will say to me things like, "Oh, it's so interesting that a foreigner is that interested in culture," and I'll be like, "Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not that much of a foreigner," you know. Yeah. Um, like, uh, it's just it's. I don't know. I'm in a particularly confusing situation because of, you know, my, my skin color, where I'm from, like all of these kinds of things. But like, Uh um, ultimately I feel like it's a really privileged position to be coming from, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like being a Chicano in the U S is great. It's like, I feel Mm -hmm. like it gives the perspective of looking at American culture from an outsider's point of view a Mm -hmm. little bit. It's like you're from there, but you're also treated as if you're not in some way. And you can see the culture, and the way mainstream culture works with a more dispassionate view, I feel like, you know, right. so it means a little bit that you feel like you're always outside of it, you know, yeah. but like that very, that very place means that as an artist, you have a, there's, there's a lot to say. You have a lot um, of observations to make because mm-hmm. of your, where you're placed in it. And myself as like a gay person, uh, you know, like mixed race, like this whole background that I have, it's like, I feel like it's given me a really rich perspective of the world that we live in. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, sense no it does it may i mean i guess at this point i'm i'm just relating to you because i you know i've grown up uh i've had some experiences where people will make racist jokes to me and kind of i'm kind of in between people will believe i'm italian if they need to so they don't yeah. want, so they don't need to believe that i'm mexican do you know what i mean like yeah. i've had situations where they're like oh you're mexican american so yeah. and you know i i have I love my dark skin, uh, so yeah. I don't have a problem with either one. But I, I do notice when people they, they to make their themselves more comfortable to make racist jokes, they kind of have to move you into a certain place. And then on the other side, when I've been to Spain or when I've been to um, uh, Argentina, uh, it's yeah. the other way where I just cannot bring up that I'm American because there's just so much politics, so many things that America has done to kind of, you know, undermine Spanish-speaking countries yeah. that they don't they don't realize that I am a similar outsider connecting back what you said. Like yeah. I'm also an outsider. I'm yeah. I'm dealing with the same kind of push 
that they're doing to you guys, except obviously they're doing it to an entire country. Whereas, yeah. you know, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain that to some people though, that, you know, they just see, oh, well, you know, you have, you know, several iPods, so therefore you don't understand, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but do you feel like your artwork is kind of, on that that champion of you know you are you are an outsider but you want to be able to tell a story well yeah i mean i feel like the artwork that i make is it's it's all about giving the voice to marginalized people so it's Mm -hmm. like you know even if you're white if you're gay you're 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 a minority and you're marginalized you know so it's like um and and the work that i make is like trying to address as many members of the queer community as possible like you know ethnicities that aren't Latino or white, you know, like African American, Native American, like Asian, whatever, you know, uh, transgender people. It's like, I want to, I feel like I've given a voice to um, people like myself, you know, which mm-hmm. would be, I don't know, I, I place myself as both Chicano and white. So it's like right. gay or Latino men, you know, like mm-hmm. I've been doing that for years. And then in the last few years, I decided that I wanted to, to make that broader and include other other voices. And that's a little, it's a little more challenging and tricky because it's like, if I paint, like that painting that you were talking about, Amor Picante, it's like, mm-hmm. it's for me to do because I am myself Latino and like, I, it's hard for, you know, like, I'm not going to make a racist image of like a Mexican. Right. <laughs> I, I am, you know, so like, <laughs> I could picture if I was white, like, uh, that some, like I might be, it might feel funny to make a painting like that, which is playing so much with Mexican stereotypes. Yeah. You know? So like, uh, and that's something that we're, when I'm making paintings of other ethnicities that are not Latino, yeah, uh, they're still queer. Uh-huh. Where it becomes harder, or when I paint transgender people, and that basically it basically means that I'm like I don't really like to make paintings unless I talk to somebody who belongs to the group that I'm painting. Yeah. So it's like I make paintings of transgender people. It's like I didn't really start to do that until I um, I made some I wrote some some trans I didn't have any friends who were transgender, so mm-hmm. I like picked up some of my fans to find like people who were transgender, and I wrote them, and I'm like. You know, could you give me your advice? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, as a transgender person, I was like, I want to make transgender paintings. Like, please tell me, like, how you see yourself, what kind of image you want to see, so that I'm painting what they, what they're imagining of themselves rather than what I imagine of them. You know, right? Uh, you know, so it's just like a, it's a process. I feel mm-hmm. like to to make make artwork about, uh, uh, you know, like about people who don't reflect my own experience. Right. I mean, I I think I totally understand that as far as just wanting to get out of your bubble. And also be sensitive to these other communities and add them yeah. to your experience, your life. And it yeah, shows yeah. that, you know, I think that's why when I see, you know, Asian lesbians, I don't feel like it's being done as a reappropriation. Um, yeah. Or even I think the new word that they're saying is culture vultures. <laughs> um, well, yeah. That you're just kind of like, I, I want that and I'm going to take that and I'm going to make it my own. Um, yeah. So that does come through. Um, Although I feel like in contradistinction to what you just said, it's not even that I want to make it my own, but I want to give it back to the community that I took it from. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like when I paint like an image of like, right, like lately I've been painting a bunch of images of Filipinos, of gay mm-hmm. Filipinos. And that's entirely based on a particular Filipino friend that I have. And so like, you know, I talked to him and I was like, you know, what's your experience of being, being, he's a Filipino American, but he's been mm-hmm. to the Philippines. So I was like, you know, what kind of image do you, you know, see as like a gay Filipino? Like, what would you, like, what are your like, you know, how would you, how would I make a painting to reflect your own experience? Right. And, uh, and it is appropriation because I'm not Filipino. I'm not Asian. I don't okay. have that experience, but at the same time I'm making it because I think it's hot. Like when he tells me what he thinks is hot, like his experiences in the Philippines about sex and these particular kinds of like beach bungalow houses that they make and things. I'm like, wow, that sounds really hot. Uh-huh. You know, like, uh, but ultimately I'm also making it for him and for uh-huh. his community and for like gay Filipinos to like, you know, see this kind of a reflection of themselves. Right. Well, you, yeah. okay. I, I see what you're saying as far as you're not reappropriating, but you're not misappropriating. You are, you are connected with what's, what they're interested in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, that I probably can, we can kind of wrap up into that's come up that I definitely, um, relate to with your vision and artwork is this idea that your art is accessible and that it's democratic in some way. And I feel uh-huh. like that's even more important right now. And, and, and if, if, you know, it fits with what you're saying as far as you make sure that you're you're not just taking something. You're you're part of the community when you um you know express what they think is sexy. So yeah. h- how how are you still feeling about the price points for some of your artwork is definitely accessible? Yes, 
Um, well, that's like one of the places where I feel like it's such a liberating thing to be an artist today as opposed to being an artist showing in galleries. Mm -hmm. It's like galleries take 50% of everything you make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so work that you sell with them has to be expensive. There's no way it can't be because it's like I need my full amount that I need plus the 50% that they're going to take. Right. And, and they just tend to be expensive spaces. They're like privileged spaces. Right. Uh, so it's like I really love being able to – I consider myself a popular artist. It's like okay. I went to art – well, and I studied, you know, like the, these artists that I'm, I'm quoting is like my favorite artists, which are were like Carol Walker and Felix Gonzalez Torres are like, you know, they're in that rarefied sphere of like the art elite, you know, where they, right. uh, the work is like worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. And, um, and I absolutely love what they do, but they, what they do in general, like I think Felix Gonzalez Torres in particular, unless you have an art education, it would be, it's kind of hard to access what he does. Yeah. Like, it, re it would require kind of going there with an artist or an art historian and someone to mm -hmm. explain to what his work means if you're not, if you just show up without an art background, you know? And I really like the idea of being able to make artwork that's, that connects to a broad range of people. It's like, the, the reason I do what I do is to, is to make people feel good and to make them feel beautiful. It's like to make them feel accepted, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and the way to do that is to make the work accept accessible, to make it so that it's something that people can can approach mm -hmm. um, so that's on the one hand that means like, making artwork that's that I was already saying things that people can understand you know right. and it also on another level is like making the work accept accessible financially so that you can afford to buy it and hang it on your wall which yeah. is also selfishly works out well for me yeah <laughs> it's like it's you know allowing me to afford to support myself and live as an artist mm -hmm. um, you know it's like it's before um, this like I, I used to uh, you know, work show exclusively in galleries, and and um, the work was really expensive, and I never knew when it was going to sell or it wasn't, and like yeah. you know, so also think it was really great, but it was just like harder. And now it's like because the work is so low, it's like it's a regular, it's a regular income that's always coming in. Uh -huh. You know, um, at least in terms of the prints. You know, like uh, I try to keep everything accessible, accessible, but you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, some yeah. of my friends that do studio art, you know, even if it does go to the gallery, they're kind of limited in how they could even do prints or other kind of um, things. Yeah. So, you know, it's very like they just got to it's like a lottery. They got to wait and hope that that sells. Yeah. And it takes yeah. hours. It costs a lot yeah. to buy the paint. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think it's great. I, I think I guess what I relate to is this, uh, you know, right now we, we see how Frida Kahlo, who's another you know, yeah. great pop icon. She's, yeah. I think, feel like every year exponentially, I see more images of her stuff. And yes. um, I think that's the power of, you know, even with that period of time with her and Diego Rivera, understanding that art needs to be accessible to the people. Um, and right now with this kind of super capitalism, late stage capitalism that's happening, I feel like that's really important in art. Um, yeah. Our educations are very expensive here in America. Uh, yes. You know, you can end up in so much debt just getting an MFA. And I yeah. feel like I feel like part of why your artwork can do what it does is because the other set of people have to work in that system. And it's weird um, yeah. that that you kind of get stuck and it, it creates art for only the elites then. Yeah. Um, but but I, I mean, I, I, I want to defend it, too, because it's like. Mm -hmm. Like like artists like like Felix Gonzalez Torres only work in that context. You mm -hmm. know, it's like uh, Kara Walker as well. It's like they make like she makes these enormous pieces that like you know cascade across the wall. And uh, and I do think that her work is harder to access as well. It's kind of, it's more much more confrontational than my work. It's like it comes mm -hmm. from this rather negative place. You know, in terms it's which it should. It's coming from a very right. it's a very harsh critique. And um, and it requires those kinds of spaces to make it possible. You know, like because mm -hmm. the opposite of that is that I feel limited, in the sense that this isn't something that I want to do anyway. But if I wanted to make, mm -hmm. you know, sixty foot long paintings that like cover an entire walls with like you know monumental figures, and uh, I could do that and and imagine I was gonna, I'm going to sell that piece on, on Etsy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it would take like, you know so long to make it. It would be so exciting. You know, like I'm not going to put a piece on Etsy to sell for sixty thousand dollars. You know, yeah. that's just not. So like the these artists who want to make these pieces that are that ambitious mm -hmm. require space. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, I do feel like the, the like the the audience is somewhat limited. It's like the people who love Felix Gonzalez Torres are like it's a rarefied group, but it's not like mm -hmm. it's that. Small. There's still like many, 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 many thousands of people. He's a famous artist and he's well loved by a lot of people. Right. And this exists to show him, you know. Yeah. I feel like 
that's why I feel like I'm, I consider myself more of like a popular artist where, right. where I, my goal is a little different, I think in terms of what I want. It's mm-hmm. like, it's a very, it's a much more specific thing. And, um, and it, and the, for me, like social media and Etsy and those kinds of ways of presenting work is absolutely perfect for what I do. It's like the, my ambition is fulfilled mm-hmm. by, by, by being able to work in those contexts, you know? Right. So, um, so I don't know. I just, I don't want to like be, be too down on like the gallery oh, no. space. I don't, I'm like, not I, trying to say like they're, they're, a, you know, they shouldn't exist. I mean, I think that, I think the separation is the difference between like, if you look at film, you have blockbuster films and then you have your indie films or you have yeah. your, your big pop icons that, are, you know, are always going to, yeah. you know, sell millions and then you got your indie stuff. So yeah. I think yeah. like that's probably what the art is, that we're talking about, like they're going to both exist and they both have to yeah. exist. Yeah. Um, but it's more, you know, obviously art that people can accept, you know, have a piece in their own home is very important. Yeah. And I think it's, it's great that you're able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I, yeah. I feel like that's a good place for me to end. <laughs> So thanks very much for being on my podcast. I'll have on the website uh, all the you know all the ways that they can find you. Definitely, okay. you're on felixdion.com is the best way to find you. And then um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Etsy, and eBay are all, all other great places for people to take a look for you. Anywhere else that anything I know right now, you have some Christmas stuff up for sale, uh, yes. Christmas cards, so people should take a look at that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're getting all crazy about Christmas at the moment, so there'll be Christmas everything. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Yeah. All right, well, thanks again very much for being on my podcast. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for listening to Never Meet Your Heroes podcast. Find us at nevermeetyourheroespodcast.com where you can post comments, ask questions, and interact with artists and listeners. Also, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe.